Uh, my name is Tim Lynch. I'm an associate professor in American politics in the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Melbourne. It's my great delight to welcome you all to the second in a four part series examining or unpacking the US election. I'm joined today uh, by Professor Roger Fairfax Jr. Roger is Professor of Law at George Washington University from where he is uh, joining us this evening. I thought I'd update the audience on, on, on where we're at and in, then Roger, get your response um, to, to the, this, this statement of where I think the campaign currently is. And I suppose the, the, the short answer to this is not much has changed since we convened seven days ago. My strong sense here is that Trump is just too far behind uh, with too little time to go in a time of the most uh, devastating pandemic in a hundred years and a recession. Uh, so I don't see a big shift from where we were seven days ago. But Roger, you're you're in the the heart of the action. Does does it look any different from your perspective? Well, Tim, you know what I'll say is, and you know I'm not a political pundit, but um, what I will say uh, is that I have seen. Um, the levels of energy uh, rise significantly over uh, the past uh, couple of weeks. I think uh, many um, on the uh, on the Democratic uh, Party uh, side um, uh, have adopted a, a rallying cry, and that rallying cry is ignore the polls. And uh, so you are seeing a, a massive get out the vote uh, effort. In fact, uh, President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, just uh, had a rally uh, this evening here in, in the States, uh, Wednesday evening, um, just, a, just a couple of hours ago in Philadelphia, um, and uh, really delivered probably the most fiery uh, speech uh, he has delivered since leaving office, and I think offered a fitting summation um, for this massive effort to get people uh, to the uh, to the polls, and so you know, I think a combination of uh, not wanting um, uh, to uh, get caught flat-footed, uh, like uh, like people uh, felt uh, that uh, happened back in 2016, uh, when uh, there were uh, a lot of um, predictions um, that ultimately uh, did not come to pass, um, and uh, and a concern, frankly, about uh, voter suppression efforts. Uh, that uh, we have witnessed and um, the need for uh, voters to be intentional about making a plan to vote and getting to the polls and making sure that their ballots uh, count. And I, so I've seen a lot of energy around that and less uh, around watching the poll numbers. How does this election compare to other ones that you've, uh, that you've been a participant in and an observer of? Yeah, you know, Tim, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we're a large country, you know, 330 million uh, people uh, with rapidly changing demographics, right? Half of the children under 18 are racial minorities. Um, you know, we're, we're going to see, you know, tremendous demographic uh, shift over the next three or four presidential uh, elections. And, uh, you know, as you know, I'm sure you know, voters of color, Black, Latino, Asian voters tend to vote Democratic, uh, with the intensity of Democratic support highest um, among uh, Black voters. White voters overall lean slightly toward Republicans, but uh, um, that preference has been consistent. And you know there is a significant difference between white college-educated voters um, and white non-college-educated uh, voters. And we saw that play out in the 2016 uh, election. You know, also a gender gap. Um, uh, uh, as well. And, um, you know, all of these factors are, are coalescing um, to, to make this uh, quite a uh, dynamic uh, election uh, cycle. I mentioned earlier the voter uh, suppression uh, efforts, um, and that really has been um, uh, the story uh, for many of folks here, right? We've seen affirmative efforts um, related to uh, making it difficult to register to vote or making it difficult to vote or um, making it difficult to have one's ballots uh, counting. And that, uh, um, that strategy has manifested itself in any number of ways. Uh, uh, insufficient polling places being available in, in um, uh, heavily minority um, uh, districts, disruption of the mail delivery of mail-in 
uh, ballots and preventing the use of absentee ballots and unreasonably technical requirements to, to vote and fears of intimidation at the polls and a reduction in early voting opportunities. I mean, many um, uh, different uh, tactics are, are being used. And, and you know, none of these tactics are, are new necessarily, but um, I think the intensity of the efforts um, uh, given the high stakes of this election is something that we haven't seen. Um, and, and in addition to the affirmative efforts perhaps to um, depress uh, the vote, uh, we've also seen inaction. Um, you know, in the midst of a public health crisis, a global pandemic, um, with uh, officials not doing enough to ensure that safeguards are put in place to allow people to vote while also staying safe and healthy. So all of these um, uh, factors are, are coming in uh, to play, and it, it really has made uh, this quite a unique uh, uh, election cycle. Race, of course, and you're an expert on the intersection of race and, and criminal justice, and it this election, even allowing for COVID, particularly in the U.S. summer, has been especially framed by this ongoing conflict. It's sparked, of course, by the by the 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 killing of George Floyd. Can, can I put to you two competing narratives about what race has done to this campaign and see if there's any capacity for for the reconcilia reconciliation between the two. The first one is that that claim that the US is and always has been systemically racist that it is white supremacist and that police and police excess is merely the, the latest manifestation of this. They, they hunt down African-Americans. Uh, they serve up black victims for the for incarceration by the criminal justice system. They perpetuate the US perpetuates through its criminal justice system a more widely black disadvantage and that black oppression intersects with all sorts of other uh, oppressions deeply rooted and strongly held in American society. Universities must enforce anti-racism. Um, African Americans must vote democratic to solve this endemic problem. That's one very definite narrative that 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 I was hearing given that the summer that the US has gone through. But the that comes up against an alternative one that the US is the most successful multiracial democracy in world history. Uh, it's had a black president and no modern Western state can sustain that, that, that claim. Um, there's more a war on cops than there is uh, a war on, on black people. Uh, that cops are the first line of defense when it comes to African-American communities. Without police, African-Americans become even greater victims of, of criminality. Cops kill whites and Hispanics in same, if not greater numbers than they do African-Americans. Um, universities must protect free speech. Uh, and the, the GOP, although this often gets forgotten, my final point in constructing this alternative narrative is that the GOP were the great liberators of, of African-Americans. I know the positions have changed. The Democratic Party for most of its early years was the enslaver, then the the segregator, or the segregator of, of African Americans from whites. Now, I see two mutually exclusive, incompatible understandings of American history there and where the American political system is going. How can those two conceptions be, be reconciled? No, th that's a lot, Tim. That's a lot. And so let me uh, let Not me see. <laughs> <laughs> let me see if I can uh, to, to break that down um, into uh, perhaps some uh, smaller chunks. You know, it, it is uh, true. You know, after the Civil War and Reconstruction, um, African Americans were steadfastly uh, supportive of the Republican Party, which, as you mentioned, had been the party of Lincoln and um, Northern reformers, abolitionists, um, anti-slavery, and. Um, at the same time, you know, in, in the wake of the Civil War, Democrats, as they began to regain power, um, particularly in the South, helped to oppress and disenfranchise African Americans, uh, you know, beginning in uh, the, the latter uh, part of the 19th uh, century. Now, the conventional wisdom is that the Black vote shifted to Democrats as the result of the Democrats' response to the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, right, including uh, Lyndon Johnson 
Jackson's work on the landmark civil rights laws passed on his uh, watch, and also the Goldwater uh, rhetoric, which alienated even many Black Republicans um, uh, during that time. You know, however, I mean, I think there's a, a different narrative um, that um, uh, has been uncovered that, you know, really a series of phenomena um, unfolding over many decades uh, began to chip away at Black support for the Republican Party well before the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the early 20th century uh, so-called Great Migration of Southern Blacks to Northern Cities, which is described so beautifully in um, a, a book called The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, that Great Migration opened up avenues for labor-friendly Northern Democrats to make entreaties to African Americans. And later we have the New Deal government of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which you know, certainly was seen by some as a missed opportunity um, uh, for Democrats to draw Black support. However, the New Deal did, um, as Harvard scholar Leah Wright Rigor has explained, um, really did begin to weaken the Republican Party's grip on the Black vote because Blacks did benefit, though not equally, they did benefit from New Deal policies. And, um, you know, issues of representation, uh, FDR famously had a, a shadow Black cabinet, right? And you started to see um, African Americans in position of power and authority, um, uh, you know, contributing to um, uh, government. And uh, also uh, Roosevelt, of course, was fortunate to be married to Eleanor Roosevelt, who was seen as an ally for African American causes, who supported not only political equality for Blacks, but also social equality in, uh, in many ways, uh, even allowing herself to be photographed socializing with Blacks, which was taboo at the time, and it sent a strong signal to uh, African Americans and all of society. Um, so despite some efforts on the part of the National Republican to, to, uh, Party to retain uh, Black support in the post-World War II era, I mean, I really think that was the beginning of the end of the Republican uh, grip on the Black vote. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, Democratic, the transition to the Democratic Party uh, was just solidified during the civil rights era and the uh, consolidation of Black political power in Northern uh, and Southern cities in the uh, early 1970s. Um, but I think it's important to understand though, in, in the context of this in your broader question, that you know African-Americans are not political sheep. And, and yes, uh, support for Democrats has been sticky um, uh, for now uh, several generations. Um, uh, in a, a new book, uh, Steadfast Democrats uh, by Ismail White and Cheryl Lair talks about group norms and uh, the role of spatial segregation um, in uh, reinforcing Black Party loyalty. But I think the Republican Party's failure to attract significant Black support is, is largely the choice of the Republican Party. So it's a function of the party's yeah. choice, not uh, Black um, uh, voters' uh, choices. And, and, and what do I mean by that? And I think the Republican Party, if it saw fit, could woo a significant swath of Black voters, frankly, without changing much of its core platform. I'm not saying the party needs to change necessarily its, its core uh, values or its expressed values um, to do that. Um, uh, there are many Black voters who see eye to eye on the socially conservative issues that Republicans often uh, push. Now, you know, some may part ways on the fiscal conservative uh, conservatism, particularly where it concerns um, divestment from government and the social safety net. But even on fiscal matters, many Black voters might find the economic opportunity and small business friendly uh, rhetoric that Republicans often uh, push appealing. So um, the question is, why don't the Republicans gain traction? I mean, I think um, in large part, it's because they've made what I assume is a calculated political judgment that attracting Black voters necessarily must come at the expense of losing some white voters, right? Yeah. Jeopardizing their solid South uh, strategy. And um, uh, what this means is that some Republicans will still traffic in the sort of dog whistle coded language or rhetoric that they believe will help them shore up uh, their base. Um, and uh, that frustrates their ability to make inroads in the black community. So, you know, again, it's a calculation they make. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I assume they've done the math, but I think the, the, um, the blame for there not being more diversity 
of, uh, of party loyalty within the black community doesn't rest at the feet of black voters. I think it rests at the feet of the party. Let me ask a question that Nick Blinko poses, Roger. If you could change one thing about the democratic system in the US, what would it be and what would be the impact? We need to uh, remove constraints uh, that are unnecessary uh, to protect the integrity of the vote, uh, to remove those constraints from voting. And there have been all you know, manner of ideas that have been floated you know, on national holiday, on election day, um, uh, you know, making it easier for people to uh, to vote, uh, you know, by mail or even online, and and obviously all of those um, uh, those proposals would need to be vetted, and uh, we would need to to make sure um, that they're compatible with um, uh, our confidence in the uh, in the system. But but I believe access to the ballot, which is something that, for instance, African Americans have been fighting for ever since um, the Fifteenth Amendment. Uh, was ratified in the Constitution um, uh, uh, and, you know, have had to remain vigilant because, um, you know, you take, uh, you know, two steps forward and, and then another step back and um, access to the ballot um, and then also encouraging and conditioning people uh, to vote. Um, those would be, um, you know, part of the package of, uh, of changes that um, I, I would have at the top of my list. In Australia, Roger, we like to posture on our compulsory voting requirement. And we often like to claim that this would solve a number of problems in the American system. What do you think to the idea of making Americans vote? Would that address some of the problems you've outlined? <laughs> I, so it's interesting. I've had this uh, discussion um, uh, with, with others. I, I, I think for, for me, from my perspective, I mean, I think as a first step, it, uh, uh, we, we need to remove um, uh, all of the barriers uh, to voting. Um, you know, I, I think what goes along with that is encouraging uh, people to exercise uh, their right, their franchise, um, and to understand how precious it is. Um, but I think in doing that, we, we, again, can't lay the responsibility at the feet of the would-be voter. We need to demonstrate uh, for these voters why it matters. Right. You know, I think there's been a lot of frustration among many and, and, and you know, and, and all um, uh, from all walks of life uh, and, and, and both political parties um, uh, about, uh, you know, voting and whether their voting has an impact. And I think, um, uh, you know, making the case um, for people um, that your vote is important. And I think part of that strategy is going to have to include convincing them that down ballot races are important. And by down ballot, I mean not just the presidential race, not just your United States senator or your member of Congress, uh, but, you know, your statewide uh, offices, your local offices, right? The local prosecutor has more influence over criminal justice policy than anybody uh, else on the ballot, including the president of the United States. And I think uh, if you can make that clear um, for uh, would-be voters, uh, you uh, might be able to um, combat some of the, the reluctance and frustration that has animated um, decision making and frankly that uh, has depressed um, uh, voter turnout uh, for so long. Yes, yes it's, it's always struck me that, that trying to get the United States to adopt what seems to work in Australia and elsewhere often forgets some of the nuance and exceptionalities of, of the American system but I agree from the very beginning of the nation who votes how they vote is has has been the source of of far more discord than it has than it has uh, uh, cordiality. What is your view on the Lincoln Project and its impact on the election? Yes, yeah, so, so I you know I you know as, as far as as, as I'm familiar uh, with it because there there has been a good bit of uh, media coverage. Um, the Lincoln Project features a, a number of relatively prominent. Uh, Republicans, um, including um, uh, some people I personally know and, and um, uh, personally uh, friends with, um, who um, have uh, decided, um, in, in their view, to put country over party um, and to um, uh, use their voice uh, to condemn um, certain actions and behaviors um, uh, that uh, they uh, believe are contrary uh, to American uh, values and uh, American 
um, uh, principles. And, you know, I, I think the, the Lincoln Project, you know, relates to um, uh, the, this broader issue, right? Because I, I think, Tim, that what we have had over the last several years is, is what I, you know, refer to as a stress test for American democracy. You know, obviously there are always struggles and challenges and nothing is easy, but we just came off of a two-term presidency um, of the first Black president um, of the United States. And, and I know uh, we are a uh, divided country and I know there's uh, polarization, but um, uh, what nobody can say about uh, Barack Obama is that he did not uphold uh, decency and integrity um, uh, in um, uh, American uh, politics. And he didn't, uh, and they couldn't say that he didn't represent our country well around the world, right? He didn't diminish the respect of the United States through his behavior and his engagement. The Federalist Papers did contemplate the possibility of uh, an ambition-fueled, self-interested figure who might prey on and stoke and exacerbate divisions within the populace through duplicity and inflamed rhetoric. They were ready for that, uh, as was also feared by many in the, in the founding generation, including George Washington and John Adams and others, um, uh, uh, was extreme partisanship and a fear that the two-party model could undermine those checks and balances and render them ineffective to counter the danger of the type of presidency I described. And uh, here, right, because of political polarization and the inability or unwillingness of uh, some elected representatives of these polarized factions to cross party lines and to demand accountability or decency or even just the truth, um, the behaviors we, we um, feared are permitted to flourish, right? And these issues, you know, such as the integrity of our elections and protecting American democracy from foreign, foreign interference, um, you know, protecting and respecting American military personnel, ensuring that public service is not tainted with uh, self-interested or self-enriching activity, and, and ensuring that the United States and its leaders are seen as decent and competent and worthy of respect around the world, and frankly, so that we're not a laughing stock. These aren't Republican ideals or Democratic ideals. These are American uh, ideals. And um, the two-party system has failed us uh, a bit in this uh, moment. And so this stress test, um, I think, will prompt a necessary uh, inventory um, and recalibration after this election. And um, I don't think I'm engaging in hyperbole when I say that we're, we're going to need another reconstruction of sorts, you know, and it, it will require work not only for the two major political parties, but for our major institutions and our professions and for ourselves as American people. Yes. No, no I, I agree with everything you've said there. You, you want the utility of an executive office of a president, but you don't want him and eventually her to be so powerful that they, they threaten the separation of powers. One of the most read things that I ever wrote was for the University's Pursuit magazine at the beginning of the Trump presidency, which uh, which argued there were there were at least ten reasons why we should not fear Donald Trump, and chief among these is a constitution which, though highly imperfect in lots of respects, has only been amended what twenty seven times in twenty four decades, has shown a remarkable capacity to control for power. That no president has overstayed their welcome. The electoral calendar still applies. Congress still has power. The Supreme Court certainly does, and that Trump will be subject to the same founding ideas of the, con the containment of power as any other uh, previous occupant of the office. I think that that's sometimes a hard sell, but it's one that I, and as I hear you describe it, you would, you would make as well, that the system is designed to preempt and control men like Donald Trump. Uh, LeBron James has, has, has offered, has postured on um, getting, uh, the African-American vote out. Does this kind of famous sportsman appeal actually get any traction amongst uh, African-American voters? You know, it, it's hard to, to say. I will say, I mean, LeBron James has been, you know, quite a model, um, uh, you know, as far as uh, activists, um, uh, celebrity or athletes uh, go. And, you know, I think he's emblematic of a, a real movement. Um, you know, and we've seen this, uh, you know, take shape 
um, over the past seven or eight months, right? The, you know, during the, the long summer of, uh, of protests um, around uh, the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and, and, and the other uh, names that you hear, um, you had uh, uh, professional athletes leading the charge, even, uh, you know, uh, undertaking a labor strike uh, for a game or uh, refusing to show up to practice unless coaches and owners um, sign on to the uh, proposition that Black Lives Matter. Um, and so, you know, there has always been a tradition of activism um, among uh, athletes in the United uh, States, uh, stretching back um, to uh, Jesse Owens uh, in um, the Berlin Olympic Games uh, uh, when he, uh, he went and um, uh, fought against white supremacy or notions of white superiority uh, there and, and on to the Mexico City games in the 60s and um, uh, athletes in the 60s and 70s who, who stood for things, uh, sometimes at great risk or peril um, uh, to uh, their own uh, economic prospects uh, there. But you are now seeing this expand beyond um, uh, the uh, superstar athletes like LeBron James to lesser known athletes with more to lose and to amateur athletes, uh, college basketball, college football is a big business in the United States, right? And um, these players have a lot to lose uh, if their pathway to professional sports um, uh, would somehow um, be uh, obstructed, but you see them speaking out in ways you haven't seen uh, before. The Women's National Basketball Association um, uh, have been on the cutting edge. And so I, I really do think this is emblematic and it is raising awareness around these issues, uh, it remains to be seen whether it is actually um, causing people who otherwise were not planning to vote to register uh, and to vote, but it certainly cannot hurt um, uh, that cause uh, there. So I commend LeBron James and the others who are, who are doing that work. Trump does not closely identify with the Republican Party. So why do we evaluate his appeal to black voters in terms of traditional party affiliation? Trump has, has opposed the question to African-Americans, what do you have to lose um, uh, by supporting me? He also recently um, uh, made the proclamation, and I use that word um, uh, uh, intentionally, that no president has done more for black people other than Abraham Lincoln, uh, than Donald J. Uh, Trump. Um, however, you know, uh, Donald Trump has also consistently shown contempt for African Americans. Uh, he has used ugly, disrespectful language in characterizing prominent Black political leaders. He uses that same language to describe predominantly Black communities, much like he has referred to other countries in derogatory uh, ways. And, you know, whereas former Republican administrations, whether you agreed uh, with policy positions or not, those administrations would feature people like Colin Powell or Condoleezza Rice in positions of influence and, um, and importance. And Trump often puts forward um, caricatures, right? Inviting internet personalities to the White House in a way that frankly, I think is intended to demean African uh, Americans. And um, he has flirted with and has refused to condemn white supremacists. Uh, he has referred to white supremacists involved in the tragic events uh, of Charlottesville a few years ago as, as good people. He, um, during the debate, just recently, the first presidential debate, he refused to condemn white supremacists when he was asked the question directly, um, telling one such group during the debate to stand back and stand by, a slogan that uh, many uh, such people immediately embraced in social media moments after he uttered it on the debate uh, stage. And so, you know, I, I think it's, it's probably a tough sell for many African-Americans um, uh, that he would be uh, a gateway uh, either to the Republican Party or um, to any other political uh, philosophy. Yes, there's a, there's a carelessness to him. Um, I've heard it described as a kind of casual racism rather than an ideological one. He's just, he doesn't think through the consequences of his behavior and, and his rhetoric. And I, and I suppose the subtext of that previous question is that he's actually missing it. He's identified a trick which he then misses that in order to retain through this dog whistle approach, the loyalty of, of, of racist, some racist whites, he alienates 
uh, black conservatives. Um, and that's a losing game. The demogra demographics don't favor this approach. The, the Republicans eventually, because they have an interest in, in winning political power, will have to broaden their appeal beyond the base that just about got Trump over the line four years ago. So I remain optimistic that there is a, there is a non-white conservative movement out there that a clever Republican leader will be able to tap and energize. Um, and that bodes well for the, for the, for the health of this multiracial democracy. D do you share that optimism, Roger? Well, I, let, let me just say with regard to the, the first point, I, I think the, the Republican Party will, will have a lot of work to do, right? There's gonna have to be truth and reconciliation uh, before you can just move on and start to try to appeal to black voters after uh, what, what has been seen over the, the past few years. But um, with regard to the, the optimism uh, point, you know, I have to say, uh, uh, Tim, that I, I do have optimism. I have to have uh, optimism. Uh, although there have been uh, dark days in the recent past and perhaps more to come, um, I'm confident um, uh, that in the uh, words uh, made famous by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, that, that we shall overcome. And I, I have the optimism of someone who recently uh, has traced his lineage back to um, uh, his paternal great grandfather, several generations back, Simon Fairfax, who was freed from slavery in Virginia in 1798, pursuant to a manumission document that sits in a courthouse just five miles from where I sit right now. And I have the optimism of Simon's daughter, Bethia Fairfax, who uh, my great grandmother, several generations uh, removed, who despite the odds as a free black woman in the American South became a landowner um, and uh, made a life for herself and her family. Um, I have the optimism of my paternal grandfather, Charles Butler, who was plucked from college at Howard University in the flower of his youth and sent to fight courageously in Europe against fascism during World War II in a segregated army only to return to the United States and suffer the evils of Jim Crow laws and discrimination. So despite the tremendous odds that they faced, they never gave up on America in trying to make this multiracial democracy, number one, a democracy, and, um, and also what it has never been, but has the potential to become. And so in light of all of that, you know, what right do I have to not be optimistic? Um, and I think the last four years, we in the United States have taken uh, you know, the best shot there is, right? You know, we, we took the, 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 the best punch, uh, uh, the best uh, uh, shot at trying to divide us and tear at the seams of this multiracial uh, democracy uh, that has always taken steps, often halting, sometimes backward, but has always taken steps in the direction of what the preamble of the constitution describes as a more perfect union. And so, so yes, uh, I must remain optimistic. Oh, that's a splendid defense of the American experiment, as, as, good as, I, as good as I've heard, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, 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 to say that to us. The United States embodies, and this is part of, it's a romantic appeal, at least for me, it, it embodies a version of the human experiment. It's the working out of the human condition it, with all its ups and downs and vicissitudes and strengths and deficiencies. The idea that it should move in lockstep with some linear notion of progress, um, it's just too diverse, too complicated a place to expect that to happen. But having lived in it um, and having observed it from the outside, that sense of expectation that foreigners bring to it is, is one that we, we apply to no other nation in the world. And of course, it, it fails often to live up to those expectations. But as you've said, I think with remarkable cogency, rem remains a, a fundamental and an enduring hope in the world. Uh, well, you know, again, I, I think there is, uh, there's great cause for pessimism, right? With what we're seeing with the polarization uh, that we uh, have seen. Um, I think, you know, someone might flip on the, the television and, and see protests um, in the streets and, and think that, you know, America is falling apart. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I will remind uh, people that uh, protest is part of the American tradition. <laughs> the, the United States of America only exists uh, as the result of, uh, of protest and, and um, you know, um, the ability to press one's grievances. Um, and so, 
Um, I, I take what has happened um, uh, over the past uh, uh, several months uh, in the United States and frankly that spread around the world. And again, this was sparked um, uh, by the video of, a, uh, uh, of a, an African-American man uh, being killed under the knee of a police officer who, who drove his knee into his neck for eight minutes and 46 uh, seconds. And that was, I think, the final straw. There had been uh, protests after um, uh, uh, similar incidents uh, across the country uh, for five or six years, right? And the Black Lives Matter uh, movement um, uh, was born after uh, the killing of a private um, uh, uh, citizen, uh, but the killing of Trayvon Martin uh, in Florida. And that movement, um, Black Lives Matter, which was, um, you know, treated as a fringe movement and has, has been treated by, uh, as a fringe movement by many, is actually um, uh, as American as it gets. Because as again, I said um, earlier, um, protest is part of uh, our DNA, right? And um, although uh, some of the more traditional um, uh, uh, you know, civil rights organizations uh, that might be seen as the direct heirs of uh, the movement that is more closely identified with Martin Luther King, et cetera, uh, may have been somewhat flummoxed by Black Lives Matter, uh, particularly at the outset, you know, because it's loosely organized, there's no head, it's, it's more of a collective, um, there's nobody necessarily in charge to make demands or to call upon others to stand down, um, but it has become um, uh, one of the most effective uh, political movements uh, in modern uh, American uh, history. And Black Lives Matter stands for the proposition that, well, you know, Black Lives Matter and that uh, Black people are entitled to the same humanity and dignity and protection uh, that uh, others uh, are. And we've seen it um, uh, uh, move from the protests on the streets into the corporate boardrooms. There are Fortune 100 CEOs now saying Black Lives Matter. We have very conservative organizations and entities across the country um, proclaiming Black Lives Matter. Um, and again, that is um, uh, just yet another uh, sign uh, that the core of America, the, right, the promise um, of America uh, is not uh, lost. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. There are lots of, uh, of fights uh, ahead. Um, but uh, what people are fighting for is uh, a more perfect uh, union at the end of the day. Um, and uh, it doesn't get any more American than that. Roger, I'm sorry that we're out of time. I, I want to thank everyone that's participated today. And I'm very sorry I didn't get through barely a fraction of the questions, which were, which were wide ranging and important ones. I, I'm, I'm, I hope, uh, Professor Fairfax will be able to rejoin us in a, in a couple of weeks. I'll try and work on him to, to get him to, to show up again. But I, I want to just put on record how terrific it's been to, to have you as a guest for, the, for this session. You've brought remarkable erudition and experience and expertise to, to some of the most vital questions afflicting and affecting the American nation at the moment. And you've offered us a cause for concern, but also considerable reasons to be hopeful and confident. And I want to pay particular thanks for you being here and, and, and doing that. Thank you ever so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And we will rejoin uh, in a week's time when we'll take on uh, the potential foreign policy effects of the election with Associate Professor Tom Daly from the Melbourne School of Government. Uh, Stay brave out there uh, and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you.